This is Paul. This is Caroline. And this is a podcast for the first episode of the fifth season of Amazon's The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. This is for an episode called Go Forward. If you're listening to this in sequence, you might be wondering, what happened to your season four coverage? But if you're listening to this in the future times, (laughs) you won't even know because we'll have gone back. Hmm. Well, it'll be like a time machine. We'll have jumped into our DeLorean, <laughs> filled in the missing blank, and and you'll be wondering, what is he talking about? Exactly. I mean, you know what? It, so much has happened since the season four ending that, you know what? I think we all get a pass for for um, <laughs> for not having as timely of a season four finish as we would have liked for our podcasting. However, we are going to be solid for season five, people. So here we go. Let's get started. Go forward. I want to start with this cold open. I thought this was amazing. It was 1981. We get a 23-year-old Esther talking to her therapist. And I really enjoyed the casting on this one. I thought that the young actress, her name is Alexandra. I don't want to butcher her last name. It's S-O-C-H-A. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. So I don't want to mess it up for you. But I just thought she was amazing. I think that she gave, especially when she was laying down her profile, was so excellent. Like, I mean, it matched Rachel Brosnahan's face so much. And of course, she had the must-have ASP, fast-talking, you know, could just spit dialogue and just do such a great job of like having this attitude and like you knew everything about her as an adult that you needed to know. And she was obviously brilliant and successful, it seemed. Like, I mean, she was like doing everything that she... I I wouldn't have expected her to be doing because they've always downplayed the children so much to start off with one of her kids was like mind blowing to me. She's in therapy and the things that she's talking about suggests that kind of like the journey that we've had with Midge is is that she's kind of in her own way, right? She, Mm -hmm. even though she's probably twice as smart as her therapist, she still needs someone to help her through these problems, finishing thoughts, communicating with others, kind of existing amongst normal humans who aren't (laughs) as brilliant as she is. But yeah, she also, she does fit that ASP fast talking brunette mold that we've seen in other incarnations of her work. Very much. And now if you guys are joining us and you're saying, I don't know who ASP is, who are you talking about? What's ASP? I don't know what this is. We're talking about Amy Sherman Palladino, of course. Get with it. Well, I just don't want you our listeners. You got to season five and you were, and you were never I curious. I don't want Who wrote them these lost, words? Paul. I don't want them lost. Hey, let's talk about the look of this episode for just a second because I am a Gilmore Girls lover. So I had the experience of a lifetime just this January 2023, unbelievably. I got a chance to go to the Gilmore Girls holiday festival that goes on out in Burbank, California on the Warner Brothers lot and had such an amazing time getting a chance to be in Lorelai's house again. I visited it before, but I've never done it during this Christmas celebration. You guys, I had so much fun. I really highly recommend it to everyone. It was only about a a week long. It's in kind of a funny time between Christmas and New Year's and it's just amazing. I mean, I'm I'm embarrassed myself. I was teary-eyed. I was teary-eyed. I was verklumped, you guys. I was like grabbing at people like, this is amazing. Like grabbing their arm, like pointing out things to people. (laughs) Yeah, it was awesome. Having said that, there are so many things about this season so far of Mrs. Maisel that is giving me a lot of Gilmore Girls vibes, especially the overall look of this episode. So I went back and actually did some digging and some research, and I was totally dead right. The cinematographer for this entire season is the same cinematographer for Gilmore Girls A Year in the Life. And that is where I was drawing the connection. I was like, why does this seem so familiar? There were scenes like when they pulled up in the Christmas tree lot with the music that was playing and the way the car pulled in and the way that they did the shot that I was like, this could have been Luke and Lorelai getting out of the car. They could have been going to some town festival thing and it all would have looked like this. So for me, Would it familiar, shock you to know that 
Alex Nepomnieski also was a cinematographer for 10 episodes of Bunheads. <laughs> no, it would not. <laughs> also an ASP creation. So for all you guys, if you are enjoying things like You're in the Life, if you enjoyed Bunheads, I think that the look of this season is going to seem really familiar. And um, this is why. I mean, this is the hand that was guiding it. So very cool. I, I always love some sort of little tie in like that. Amy and Dan didn't seem to do a ton of directing during the main run of mm -hmm. Gilmore Girls, but they did direct A Year in the Life, and they've directed a lot of Mrs. Maisel. And one thing that I noticed uh, is kind of a, an active camera on on a lift or a crane. That, I think, is the meeting point uh, with this cinematographer. That, that's what he gives them. They're, they tell him, we want the camera to follow them. We want them to lift up over this scene. We want everybody to soak in everything and with a wide angle. And he gives them that. And there's a lot of like these kind of swing around moments, like when the car is pulling up and then the camera almost meets it, but then swings around to the back or, you know, the kids are running ahead and the camera like catches up to them and this kind of swings over their head. There's a lot of movement, a lot of energy in the way that they do the filming that gives again, like just sort of this other extra personality to the show that is great. You know, I think it's something that it needs when you have this fast dialogue, you need to match it with, you know, the actual filming style. I'd like to comment on the approach that shows take with their finales and the pressure of having a of of you know there's there's shows that that have long engagements and they're pretty sure that they're not going to end quote unquote this season so they don't need to stick the landing with whatever it is that they're doing but Amy and Dan knew that this was a stick the landing season and this is becoming more and more an important element of how a show is regarded historically and whether and maybe just knowing Amy's kind of mercenary approach to her work, if people are going to rewatch it again in the future, thus generating clicks, thus generating revenue for her, right? Okay. So if the last season is crap or people kind of talk about it in that way, then does it create this negative spin that's like people don't rewatch it? shows that have that negative whatever maybe they don't get rewatched whereas beloved shows that quote unquote stuck the landing people just digest over and over and over and over again because they don't feel bad and then there's also those people that never bothered with the show wait for it to end to see what the buzz about the ending is and then decide whether or not they're going to watch the show mm, so a lot of pressure on this final season so when i see them doing flash forwards instantly i'm thinking some of the best regarded finales on cable and streaming have been those denouement heavy this is where everybody wound up kind of endings yeah i agree with you wholeheartedly one of my very favorite is six feet under and that was definitely one that took it all the way like you know what happened to everybody universally regarded as a as a perfect mm -hmm. wrap up to that show and a template for how to do it right but I, does that mean you have to do it all in one episode with sia playing uh background music or can you kind of sprinkle it along your final season and give everybody their due without just needing to kind of put in everybody in weird makeup and do it in 15 second intervals at the end. Right, like montage of everybody's right. endings. You're you're totally right. I mean, having the the information at the beginning that this is going to be the last season, certainly the writers have the opportunity then to like you said, sprinkle it throughout. I also feel like I, I imagine this in my head, okay? I don't I have no confirmation for this, but this is how I feel. I can imagine after doing Gilmore Girls and really feeling like they didn't get to end it the way they wanted to end it. No. And then coming back with a year in the life and seeing how people really wanted to know where characters ended up and how passionate fan bases are for seeing what happens in the future. I could see where their experience with Gilmore Girls and specifically the the clamor for a year in the life 
would encourage them to show, to do these time jumps and mm-hmm. show where do people end up so that they don't basically end up at the end of Mrs. Maisel with people clamoring for a year in the life 10 years from now to find out what happened to Maisel. Like they can wipe their hands clean and say, you all know what happened to <laughs> exactly. Mitch, you know, like, and it's over for good. So, so I'm going to chalk this up to like, sort of like lessons learned to like experience of what fan bases want. And like you said, really wanting to to stick the landing and make sure that people feel satisfied with what they've seen. And so already I feel better that we've seen Esther at 23. We know she's a smart kid. We know that she's going to be successful, or at least we get the vibe that she's going to be successful. I feel like we're getting a, a taste of their relationships with all of the things about like, I spoke to my grandfather and I had that. It was a one liner, but you now it's like, I already know everything that happened with Esther and Abe. They were good buddies and they could talk to one another. I know that from one sentence in a therapy office. That makes me feel like really like they're filling out all those characters Mm -hmm. that like for the most part, you know, this show was not about the kids. It was not about Esther. It was not about Ethan. Barely speaking roles. Barely. But now because of this cold open, I cannot help but seek the kids out in this season. Like I'm like really searching for like, what is Esther saying now? What is Ethan doing now? I'm trying to put little pieces together of how we get to be 23 year old Esther because now you've shown me her. So I care about how she got there. Really, I think smart, creative, a nice twist on storytelling. And I think that this series needed something else like we talked about at the end of season four despite the fact that we didn't record everything we talked about paul and i talked a lot actually about where midge ended up in season four and what we kept coming back to over and over again was there's got to be a time jump there's got to be a time jump and the funny thing is there's not a time jump we're literally the morning after everything happened but because of this cold open you get the feeling that we moved forward And that's kind of a wacky twist to do to the audience because we didn't. We're back in 1961, literally the morning after everything that happened at the end of season four. So there's still repercussions. There's still consequences for all of those things. They still have to kind of figure out what to do next. But because of this 20 year time jump, we kind of it scratched that itch a little bit for me of wanting to feel like please show me more. Please don't leave me in 1961 at the end of the series. Let's move on to the main thrust of the episode. The, like you said, the morning after and everything that happens, starting with Thanksgiving. I got to talk about the fact that one of my very favorite Gilmore Girls episodes is deep fried Korean Thanksgiving, right? It's one of my favorite episodes and it consists of a variety of Thanksgivings. We have one at the Kim household. We have one at Suki's house. We have one in the diner with Luke. And then we also have to go to the parents' house. And all of these, Lorelai brings bouquets of flowers. And that cracked me up as we're starting this Thanksgiving episode because we have, you know, all the wives, all the women in the kitchen cooking. And the main thing that Rose is concerned about is the flowers. And when she says, the only thing people care about at Thanksgiving is the flowers, I like cracked up laughing because I'm like, of course, that's not true at all. But there's an entire argument about flowers (laughs) throughout the Gilmore Girls Thanksgiving episode. So I got to think this must be something in Amy Sherman Palladino's (laughs) family. She's poking at someone, I hope, because this is like across the board. She's consistent with flowers at Thanksgiving. What did you think of actually seeing all the family members come back together? Like we had brother Noah on screen. We had Astrid, which for us, succession watchers, you guys know her as Willa. So wild to see her now because we just watched some pretty amazing succession episodes happening. And, you know, she plays such a big role there. We even had, just to throw this out, and it wasn't during the Thanksgiving part, but I got to throw this out. Frank from Succession was also on this one, which I thought was crazy to see him. He is over on the Gordon Ford show playing like, it, what What was he, like an announcer type? I couldn't even or tell you exactly. Who stage he, director or something. He, it just says he played George in credits. <laughs> and right. so I'm not sure exactly what George's um, job description Some is. behind the <laughs> camera uh, yeah. kind of guy. But it was super cool to see him. I'm, I'm going to go through a couple of other people who were back. I mean, we got to see Jason Ralph, who is Rachel Brosnahan's real life husband, as Mike Carr came back. We even saw Mrs. Mouskowitz who was even back and we've got zelda we've got like all of our favorites can i just tell you one thing though that was funny yeah who was that one dude who was just wandering around the apartment the whole time (laughs) 
and sort of like the beatnik uh, sweater. And... No, like not a sweater. He was like he was like a maintenancey man. Yeah, he was like he was fixing measurements. things and yeah. doing. I don't know. That was funny. I don't know what he was doing in the background, but you always have some. It looked like a acting class challenge, right? Like busy yourself with with this <laughs> in the background of the scene. That's funny. Don't get in the way too much, but be present in the moment. Uh, that's funny. I love all that. Um, and of course, you know, Lenny Bruce, who's one of our very favorite, Luke Kirby. He was back in this episode, although when we get to him, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you I shed a little tear. Um, we also had the actress uh, who played May come back on this one. So lots of lots and lots of faces that we know. They practically went down the entire cast um, and brought everybody into this episode. So there was a lot going on here, including old Alfie. He's back, too. So let's dive in to this first Thanksgiving we have at the Maisels, and let's just throw out some things that we found out going on there. The big headline is obviously that the Maisel seniors believe that their best path forward is divorced. Okay, now you know what I'm going to say to anybody who's watched any Gilmore Girls action. Separating the parents is like a whole theme that Amy likes to do. I'm not exactly sure why, but she definitely did this with Emily and Richard. And we've already seen this play out with Rose and Abe. So now we're going to see this with Moish and Shirley. Uh, what do you think about this? I mean, is it a fresh enough plot line with these two? Because they're going to play it out. Certainly, they're not going to Paris like Rose and Abe did. So this isn't going to play out the same way. But what do you think about these two and, and the, the idea that they would actually get divorced? A... It seems late in the narrative for this kind of drama. B, it's never really been about the senior Maisels. So the fact that they're having this big plot development is almost like, well, it's, it's too late to really invest in you. <laughs> well, they're trying to give them something to do, right? So I understand that. Is this the right thing to do or, or like, have we already been at this well? We know that from later events in this episode that we'll discuss when we dig further into Joel, that Joel feels his life is out of control a little bit, you know, the, whatever peace and balance that he had found with having May in his life, having his club sorted out, being separated from his dad's business, et cetera, et cetera. All that is in question after this episode. Throw into that your parents having to navigate this faux divorce situation. Maybe it's not so much a development for us to follow Shirley and Moish as it is for us to sympathize and, and ratchet up the stakes for Joel. Ah, I like that. Okay, so that just puts more pressure and more tension for him, right? Yeah, they're just tools. Just tools to twist screw little screws in Joel. I really felt for Joel because he did speak up in this one and made this announcement that, you know, he's going to get married, he's going to have a baby, and everyone congratulated him, and they were all excited. And, and he's at the kid table making this oh my God. Okay. dumb announcement. <laughs> Well, he came over to the adult table to make the announcement. And then I loved how like Midge jumped up and like ran over to the adult table. The whole adult kid table thing. Look, we totally have that stuff in our own family. I know most people do, but it really cracked me up because it was like try to get out of the kid table like as bad as you can. And the the, the idea that it was going to be like Midge and Abe. And, well, the ball's on Astrid. There. I mean, oh, yeah. this isn't her family. I mean, right. This is like the in-laws of her sister-in-law, ex-in-laws. She's like pushing around. Yeah. What's she happening? moved the place cards. That was so funny. Guess what? You're last in line, sister. <laughs> Sleeping child. Leave it. Don't bring it to the Leave table. It. Nobody wants us wants your baby business at the table. Your baby business. Well, she was very, very proud of that little baby. Everything it was yeah. doing, all the pointing and all well, that. If you recall, it wasn't super easy to get that baby. So, yeah. I, I do recall. What else stood out to you about the Thanksgiving dinner? Well, we have this announcement of a trip that the Weissmans are going to be taking, and they're very excited. I found this all so odd that the bank just, like, gave her a trip. <laughs> it was so strange. I'm sure it was popular at the time. I do remember a time when you used to get gifts when you opened a bank account. Do you remember that? When we'd open a bank account and you'd get luggage or something, or you'd get... I remember being a teenager and we got some sort of prize package or some crap for opening your account you with know, the bank. You pointed out to me that later on, after the trip doesn't work out, that Rose is, is putting things together. What if it wasn't canceled? 
What if it never was? What, your, your bank? <laughs> what? I like the idea of it being like that much of a prank like that, right? So, all right. Based, all right. We're not there yet, though, Paul. We're not there yet. I know, but. but we're not, cause, because we are going to unravel that mystery. For anyone who didn't figure it out, we're going to tell you at the end what we think was going on, okay? Because I think that the iron shirt with the iron on it also plays into this because he said every single one of his shirts came back from the dry cleaner like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm eyebrowing, eyebrowing about this whole thing. But we're not there yet, Paul. We can't go there yet. Not yet. Okay. So there's going to be a trip to Palm Beach. So wild, so crazy. I don't know any bank that does this, but pretty Mm -hmm. rad, right? (laughs) Pretty exciting. So we're going to kind of whiz through Thanksgiving and we're going to bust over to after Thanksgiving when Joel actually heads back to his apartment with the kiddos and who's waiting for him the future ex mrs may uh <laughs> mazel i never thought about her name would be may mazel may mazel may mazel that's so funny it's like julia gulia <laughs> it's kind of like julia gulia yeah very 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 similar very funny so may has some news she has decided to take a job in chicago she wants to pursue that and additionally there is not going to be a baby now for people who have not put this together this is the 60s we watch a ton of mod <laughs> <laughs> that might sound funny to you guys, but we love mod. And uh, this would be the right time period for, like, in a mod episode, they would look directly into the camera. And say, it's legal now in New York. That's exactly what happens on the mod episodes. So this clearly was a situation where May got an abortion and decided not to continue with the pregnancy. This was a big deal. You know, she did this without saying anything to Joel. It's a big deal. It was a big decision for her to make. Now, May had shown up at the hospital and had shown like complete concern for Moish and everything in season four. So I thought they were more on the same page. But as this conversation was happening, as he was realizing that she had nothing in the entire apartment, like nothing, she had a sweater and he didn't even notice that she didn't have any stuff there. Like, I find all of that wild, probably because I am very messy with my stuff. And if my stuff was not there, there would be a void. Like, there would be a big blank spot where all my stuff would be. So I'm like, okay, Joel, like, had you not noticed like this situation was that much on the rocks? But I wonder if, you know, if you look at Stephanie Shu's accomplishments between seasons here, she was in... Shang-Chi, the Marvel uh, movie. She was in Aquafina. Uh, is, is Nora from Queen. She was in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once with a pretty major character. She has done a ton of work. And I got to wonder if maybe some of that took up her time or perhaps her upcoming projects took her off the slate, you know, in terms of being available for this. If it does kind of shape up this end game of will Midge and Joel get back together? Oh no, but, are you thinking that? Well, I mean, I don't want to think that. I mean, but... are they trying to open the the door for that? Because man, I'm not, I'm not there. I don't, I don't think that's happening. I don't know what's gonna happen with Midge, but dang, I don't go back. To I like Joel. May. I mean, I really I liked like me too. May. She was very funny, smart, sharp, witty. And kept Joel on his toes, man. Like, so, so smart and just quick-witted with every little comment. Loved all of that stuff. And, you know, moving forward to pass the what seemed like a final goodbye. She says she's going to send the address, but I don't know. I think this is a final goodbye. But then we have Joel, who who's absolutely taking this breakup very hard. And, and I think it goes, of course, beyond the breakup and also the loss of a child, like because he just found out that this happened, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's not like he had any way to sort of prepare himself. So he was not only losing May, but he was also losing a child. And so for him, seeing him on the stage was such a bookend to the pilot. Season one, yeah. Yeah, because think of Midge getting broken up by Joel and he walks out. And she goes in her pajamas and is all like completely out of it and does her first stand up bit. Right. Right. And so now here we have Joel who stumbles up on the stage and tries to kind of do the same thing. Like he says, like basically, you know, like turnabout's fair play. Like I can talk about my ex-wife now, which goes over horribly, just horribly. So what do you think about this? I mean, were we supposed to catch this book ending of like, there's a breakup and then this is how the person deals with it. They go on stage and they try to just get it all out. Yeah. I think we were supposed to feel that I'm not entirely uh, sure why we, why 
we needed to have him bomb. I mean, he it's like he it's like he was I, holding something like a snake or something, and he had it for a minute, but then it got <laughs> away from him, you know. But I think that's that's Joel. I mean, that's the thing. Midge was always the one bringing the brisket and getting him the spot. Now he owns the club, so he gets up there, but he never had the goods. Remember, he was stealing it from all of the stand up records that he was listening to. Mm-hmm. So he never had the goods. He never could write, you know, a funny joke and be up there and actually do a whole routine and everything. So, I mean, I think this was just for me, it was just like nail in the coffin. Like he thought because he owned the club now. Okay. So now he did everything he could to be the one in the spotlight and control it. And he still made a mess of it. I mean, hearty laughing over here. (laughs) Well, and he, he, um, I think you can go back and listen to podcasts where I've, where I've kind of waffled on Joel, but I think you'll find more where I'm down on Joel. It's not like I want bad things for him. It's just, I wanted to know his place. I think we got a little taste of who Joel was, is by what Moish said when he said the reason why he's not retiring is because when you get close to like losing your life, you have this moment where you're like, I didn't accomplish all the things I want to do. Right. And so you think Moish is going to say, I love my family so much. I'm going to spend more time with my family, which is what Shirley wanted him to do to retire. But not unlike Joel, Moish's attitude is I need to expand my business. Like being successful and and everything, if my life is over, is all about my business. I think that Joel just doesn't get it. And he's coming from a dad who, to me, you're not getting it if you think you need to spend more time at work than... I don't think you got the you got the message you're supposed to get in the hospital, you know. So Joel tries to deal with this though by going down and confronting everyone down in the gambling situation down there, and that went amazingly well for him. Would you say? Uh, I mean, that was like walking into a, a different country and trying to pick a fight. And, well, and it went down about the same. As but that it would was be. so stupid. He knows. There's bouncers that always hang out by the door. I mean, this it's is a an gambling illegal, establishment. It's an illegal, <laughs> right? It's <laughs> right. an Ill- illegal establishment. Did he think he could go down there for a second and cause a scene and not have them shut it down immediately? Because, you know, I mean, they're illegal down there. They can't be doing all this. So I, he was looking for a crazy. fight. I mean, he, he, he was yeah. picking up on women who were there yes. with, with other men. Yes complimenting ladies boobs that is not the way not to get punched in the mouth that's true he does what (laughs) where i was going a second ago is that i've never understood why he deserves all these parachutes like like archie coming up and saving him trying to get the band to come back on stage finding his way back after the penny pan mess (laughs) debacle i guess it's that he has more good than bad it's just it's just sort of like a 51 49 for me Yeah, no, I have no need for Joel to have a successful ending here at all. There's no part of me that has really any love for him. I don't think he is someone who ever was on her level. And he just seems like somebody who, like you said, doesn't deserve all the parachutes, doesn't deserve to have been living in a place that his dad bought. Everything he did was really on his dad's coattails always. And ultimately, the Button Club, he's really just pursuing something that out of like spite. You know, it was like he wanted to be the one on stage. He wanted to control everything. And the only way he could do that was not through being talented, not with actually having what it takes, but by owning the club and being able to just walk up there anytime you want. Yeah. You know, that's a certain kind of guy who, for the most part, no one really wants to be friends with because they don't have those ingredients, you know, that make you someone you want to hang out with them. So, Joel bad sitch I, I think he's he's well busted up it looks like he got, they worked the torso quite a bit <laughs> he looked like he's going to be in pain for days and he is very lucky that archie came up there and said something because man even the band was ready to beat him up so it did not look good for him no so joel and may i think that they're it's a farewell for them i think it's it's ultimately over may's been She's awesome. She's been I wanting to be a doctor around. more than she's been wanting to do anything else her whole life. And Joel, maybe she listened to the podcast and <laughs> and and saw that Joel wasn't her ticket. Yeah, you know, she didn't need a ticket. That's the thing. She what she she's needed, her own ticket. Well, what she needed was no one to drag her down. She needed no one to drag her down. And 
the entire getting married and having a kiddo situation, unfortunately, for most people, really slows progress for anything, whether it's career, college, whatever it is you're trying to do, you kind of have to pump the brakes and you have to cocoon up and deal with kids and marriage and life like that for a little bit, try to get your footing a little. She didn't have time for that. She can't take a pause. She doesn't have that ability, partially because she's absolutely a minority in wanting to pursue becoming a doctor as a woman in 1961. Like, I mean, she is doing it, you know, and I appreciate that throughout. If you really listened, the dentist that uh, Susie was supposed to go see was a woman, supposedly that that's what Midge says. And then now we have May, who's a woman who's going to become a doctor. I thought that they actually did a great job of like, showing women being successful, even if it's not like with like this big spotlight or this big marquee with your name on it. Women pursuing their goals was happening all around us in this episode. Except for where we want to break in, which is the male-dominated entertainment business. And that consumes the rest of the episode. It really does, yeah. So we have a lot of Susie and Midge action here. I appreciated Susie coming over the morning after. Love it that that, that that's who like Rose and Abe figure to call is to like get her over here because they can't even figure out what she's talking about. They don't know what's going on. What a mess Midge is in. The black toe thing, I like barfed in my mouth. <laughs> that was horrible. Well, Alex Borstein plays that whole bit just perfectly <laughs> it was so good the frozen crotch dying dying at the concept of a frozen crotch is it bad no right and then she's all like what does your crotch look like i mean that was hilarious so funny so many well-written lines always in this series but man this one had lots it was excellent we're not going to recap all of the funny things that they said because right. a reenactment brought to you by caroline no. and paul i'll be playing Susie. no i'm playing Susie. <laughs> definitely no one's playing Susie. so Amazing. Loved all of it. I loved how Susie and Midge, like, not only, I mean, remember how difficult season four was with the pushing and the pulling? We've had a lot of pushing and pulling with their relationship. And I feel like Midge really was on board with Susie, like, right at the start of this. She's like, I trust you. I believe you. I, you know, I'm well, doing whole, this. I know everything blew up on her. She well, made the whole try Alfie to do bit it. was her affirming out loud to us what you're saying kind of reaffirming her commitment to Susie by trying to convince Alfie to yes. stay with with Susie but that was really what you're saying kind of just putting the cherry on top of the end of that turbulence in their time together which I was very ready for that turbulence to be done um so we'll see how that goes I mean I never got do you remember there was like an interview that we heard where like ultimately it was like Midge was going to end up in like an apartment with like a bunch of like standard poodles or something by herself. And it was like, whoa, that's what's going to happen. That doesn't seem like she's with Susie. That doesn't seem like she's with Lenny. That doesn't seem like she's with Joel or any of these other guys who have come walking through or anything like it very much seems like she was alone at the end. When I read that interview, I was like, oh, man, is that where they're really going to go with this? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If she ends up being a single professional woman who's happy and successful and everything, that's fantastic. And I'm happy for that to be the ending. But it does mean that we have to lose some of these characters along the way. She becomes Jean Smart in Hacks. That's actually very much what I think this feels like. And I know she's based on Joan Rivers. So, I mean, there's a lot going on here. But let's get into the portion where we are going to the diner first. Let's do our potluck dinner for, for Thanksgiving. I thought this was very cute. It was a cool way to bring in, again, a lot of these other characters. We so brought in some Susie's old ones. Susie's uh, Misfit Toy Island. It kind of was, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I loved even how the waitress was like, none of this is our food. <laughs> like, stop blaming us. Loved all of it. I thought it was super funny and just great to be back there and actually have this camaraderie, you know, where reminding us again that Midge is a part of this community too. Like when she was bringing stuff in Tupperware and she's like, oh, you got to know, you got to like dunk the, the rolls and stuff. Like she knew about his biscuits, you know, like she knew what you needed to do, which means like they actually have this little community. It was good to remember that she's not just this person all by herself out in the world because for a lot of this time, that's how they played her. But we remember she came from that group. Remember them all sitting together in the diner, talking, making jokes, talking about gigs and stuff. There was a lot of different conversations that happened over many seasons where you got to see these little moments that she did have a comedian community. 
love to get back to that a little bit because we could use some of that action, I think. Amy loves these big kinetic ensemble pieces, you know, where she gets to assemble several people contributing with just a line here or there but it's all in a in a sequence and it's all it's all shtick 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 after shtick and, and it's all good and, and funny but that's what you're talking about and, and it's one of the, been one of the hallmarks of the of the work that i've ever seen with her it's just kind of these complicated choreographies of people who've got to hit their marks hit their lines hit their everything for a constantly moving camera and if they have to reset it's a big deal <laughs> it's 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 like resetting the munchkins at the beginning of uh munchkin land in, in in oz you know it's like this is a big deal that's going to take a lot of time to reset yeah you know? right absolutely so all of that stuff set up this idea that Susie is managing Alfie and she's finally got him this big gig in Vegas and this is going to start entwining Midge a little bit into helping Susie out kind of making this this I I think this is her way of of saying sorry to Susie for not believing in a lot of the things that she told her to do and this was like the moment where if she could get Alfie out there doing stuff it was sort of like a unspoken promise like if I get Alfie on this plane and get his career going then somehow I am committing to also believing in Susie and getting my career back on path. Like there was something about the actual action of putting that little unaccompanied <laughs> traveler thing over Alfie's neck and sending him on his way that felt like, okay, we, we're seeing this. We're seeing Midge get someone else to believe in Susie. This is so solidified now. Well, know? and that gave us a chance to hear the little bits about that Alfie is a diamond in the rough. He has been selling shows this is a big step for him Susie did do well by picking this guy out of nothing out of nowhere which is wild and and you're right it does speak to the fact that Susie has the potential to be successful which up until this point we're still unsure we still don't know exactly if she's going to find more clients or not so I thought all of that was great. At the airport, we actually have a couple different run-ins. Um, we have Midge running into her parents and we were dealing with that whole reservation situation. Now we can delve into this for a minute. I really thought it was really hilarious that Abe was so pissed about the fact that she was at the airport, but she had refused to actually bring them to the airport and, and have the kids see them off and all that kind of stuff. But go ahead and talk about now what you think might be going on with these reservations and all this stuff. Well, Abe mentions on their way out, just this run of bad luck, you know, two flat tires in a week. Now that is pretty weird, but that is also the kind of crap that happens when, when you piss somebody off, right? Yes. That, like you mentioned earlier, the irons left on his shirt from the cleaners, this trip appearing out of nowhere and then evaporating back to nowhere. Right. Just jerking their chains like all over the place. Like that's crazy. So when there's actually that phone call that Rose makes and starts doing those different accents, I hope that everyone caught it. I don't know if they did. So if you guys remember in season four, it's been a long time. If you guys don't go back and watch or take notes like we do, <laughs> which would be understandable as you're just watching a TV show. They were in this huge fight with the matchmakers. So remember, we had Kelly Bishop come on and play like the head of the matchmakers. And we had all these different matchmakers. We had an Italian one, an Irish one. We had all these people who were going to run her out of town for her trying to get into the matchmaking game. These women definitely seem like they could pull the strings on things like dry cleaning. Like, that's amazing. I like that. That was really funny. The canceled trip thing, I don't even know how deep that goes. Like, did they get to the bank manager and mess around with her? Or did they get to someone at the airlines and just cancel their tickets? Or like, what? how deep does this go? I'm dying to know. And are they going to continue it? I got to think this is going to be a running shtick for a while. It's almost like Amy and Dan watched Breaking Bad and were like, let's do that. But with something no one would ever think of before. So like women running a matchmaking service instead of meth. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Instead but the of same like, territoriality, like the same drug kingpins. Right. Ex ex exactly. <laughs> so instead of like Nacho and Gus Fring right, and all that, right. it's, it's the Kelly cartel. Bush. Right. It's these people. But it's the same kind of thing. It's like, hey, 
we're operating here. You just can't move in. And this is my turf. Like right. I work this section of the world and you cannot be here. And I'm loving it that they're playing like this. And I love the passive aggressive bullshit that these women are doing because it's all small. It's all the like butt missing from your shirt. You know, there's like no sugar in the sugar bowl. Like there's all this kind of and those things did not happen on this episode. It's just an example of just little things that get under your skin that you're like, wait, what? Wait, what? Like what just happened? I think this is masterful and funny and like a nice background, like just low level, just gag that's going to be going on. And it's, I mean, I know our audience might be mostly women, but women have a, have a reputation for a passive aggressive style offense. Oh, sure. Like we're totally going to poison you over just shoot you. And this is that kind of stuff. This is death by a thousand paper cuts, man. This is like, we're just going to make your life this difficult. And like, can you change your tire? Sure. We didn't run you off the road, but we're just going to keep making it difficult enough for you to put it together and back off, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm eager to see if they're going to keep playing this out, how it's going to work. Now, the one meetup in the airport made me so teary was Lenny and Midge. I felt like this was a massive goodbye. This is 1961. Reminder, Lenny Bruce passes away in 1966, and we know he passes away in his Hollywood home. So we know now he's here to take the trip to take him to L.A., and we know we're only a couple of years away from him passing away. I don't think we see him again. I think this was the goodbye. I think this was full closure with his speech about not blowing it her assuring him she's not going to blow it and you know they said everything they needed to say the tension between them that had been present in the previous seasons had completely worn off in this meetup it was so teary-eyed a, a courtesy you know that he didn't even really mean to have because he never called her that's true he was just gonna leave not only leave he was going to disappear he was going mm -hmm. to go to the opposite coast no, he's a well-known comic, so it's will not like he can him, actually disappear. Yeah, will we see him like on the Jack Parr show on TV or whatever? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. I just think that the Midge-Lenny portion, the relationship portion, the, the will-they-won't-they they, yeah, more, 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 right. more is, yeah, I think that evaporated. And that was sad. And for some reason, I admit, you guys, I was having an emotional day today, and I filled up with tears. Because I know this is the finale, I know this is the ending, a lot of these goodbyes we're having, like May, like Lenny Bruce, like, this is it. This is it. This is the curtain call. Like, everybody's coming out to do their, like, goodbye to Midge, goodbye to Joel, goodbye to whoever. And it's like, oh, you know, it's happening. It's all happening. <laughs> well, and Luke Kirby, I mean, I know that Lenny is, is a real person, but he made such a study of Lenny as a character and he embodied him and he won awards for, for playing him so well, even though it was basically a guest star role. Yeah. You know, you're right. Seeing him there looking like shit by that. I mean like disheveled kind of like he'd been up all, all night. Yeah. His eyes were all sunken in. And, and, but we're, I mean, in Lenny's timeline, he was near the end. He was starting to have, a uh, greater dependency on substances toward the end of his life. So I think they showed us what the beginning of that trail looked like. And maybe it's better for us. And the and kind of the flavor of this show is not to show Lenny Bruce on his decline. It's mm -hmm. it's just to be like, well, now he's not in Midge's life anymore. And the name of the show is The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So. Right, right. They crossed paths. You know, there was a moment when she crossed paths with him. And, and it was an amazing time in her life. And that's that's what this is about, right? These sort of like moments in her life that we're seeing we know we're not seeing every single second of every single thing she ever does i wonder though with the flash forward with esther it makes me wonder if that's like a promise to us to flash forward to important things mm. so i kind of wonder like even if we play this entire season in 1961 will we continue to have some sort of flash forwards or some sort of something that allows us to see a clipping, you know, of his death or a news reel happening that says, you know, mm -hmm. he passed, something like that. I feel like we are going to get closure on his death. I really don't think they're going to leave it ambiguous. I think they will say he died. And I think that she will be crushed when that happens. If you think about what you just said, the, the moment with Esther doesn't seem important. But in that second, she claims to have made some medical 
mm-hmm. scientific breakthrough right. that for all we know is very real and important. We're going to have to do some extra research on exactly what she said. And we're going to have to see, if, I think if you're going to approach the first episode and the first scene in a flash forward, you're telling me we're going to continue to do these flash forwards. Oh, yeah. And so I am looking forward to it an entire season of flash forwards. <laughs> Honestly. So let's jump over real quick over to Mike Carr and the entire situation going on with Midge and Susie and the stalking of Mike to try to get Midge back on Gordon Ford's radar screen here. What did you think about the way that they let this story unfold? The Christmas tree farm we had, we have the burlesque club, we have everything happening to try to solidify something for her. Did you enjoy how this played out? Do you wish they did it any differently? It gave us a chance to see the the character that Susie has become. When we met Susie, because you have to make that first episode comparison, pilot episode comparison. If you're going to show us Joel on a stage, then it might be natural to make other comparisons. And so with that episode going to Susie, she is surly, but she's also kind of inward. She's She's not particularly outgoing or bold. Mm -hmm. She's very insecure and and very naive in a lot of ways. For as tough as she is, she doesn't know how the world works. I mean, when she said, who convinced me to get a top sheet? (laughs) The beginning, like I was like laughing at that, like the idea that like she didn't even know about a top sheet. Like she always just had like one on the bottom and a blanket, you know, and like and and, but that makes sense for her. And like so so she has shown a lot of growth. I agree with you, even in those little tiny moments. And here she is. She's breaking into 30 Rock, getting escorted out. She's chasing him down at the uh, Christmas tree lot. She's making the most of a chance encounter at the burlesque club. That was amazing. Unless something stands out to you about those events, I think as a whole, I just kind of digested all of that as just giant progression uh, of Susie in her pursuit of of trying to be the be a, a legitimate talent scout manager whatever the right terminology is an re- agent representative mm-hmm. for her people totally agree i think that it had this been season one we would have seen her sit for an entire episode to try to figure out how to get to mike carr or how to get to gordon and instead you know we have her already know exactly where to go like how'd she know he goes there for christmas tree shopping you know like we don't have to go through the rigmarole we know the way she thinks now we know the way that she does like research she has her like goons and whatnot we know how she does this now so you're right she's operating way more smoothly and being way more successful very effective in what she was doing she figured it out she needed to sidestep mike and get right to gordon and that was the key and that was incredibly smart i do want to point out that you said you kind of took all this and digested it as Susie's progression. I would also say that I got to think that Mike as a as a character is going to be playing a much larger role, it seems. They certainly gave him a ton in this episode compared to like the one second he had previously, really. That was fascinating. I'm eager to see them. I like to see Mike playing off of Susie. I like all the flipping off, all the like, fuck you, <laughs> all the all the ways she messed with his children. <laughs> <laughs> was like hilarious to me like she knows how to do things now and i i commend her on all of that i also am now looking forward to having midge actually have a job in the same building with mike because again remembering that they're actually married i think there's some possibility for some romantic entanglement there that would not uh... surprise me but mike unclear if he was married i mean i know he had the three kids Mm -hmm. but there wasn't a wife there not in the car so unsure if there is a wife or not not totally Mm, clear put him up on the cork board i would like to put him up as a potential romantic interest which would make a ton of sense again given that they're married in real life and that it would make a ton of sense that they expanded his role too Mm -hmm. so that when they go to marvelous mrs mazel con day to go do autographs or if they're going to be at paley fest or if they're going to be at wherever they're going to be they get to go as a couple now and that that makes fans like thrilled to get to see people like that and i'm sure it makes rachel and jason thrilled 
to actually be able to do this together. So very cool. And that's something that definitely we see ASP appreciate, I guess, you know, like she's she's cool with family. Word is we're going to see some Kirk action from Gilmore Girls on this season. And that's hilarious to me. Not that he's playing Kirk, but that it's going to be Sean Gunn. Yeah, I think that's so funny. Well, uh, Milo's coming back too. Right. I mean, yeah, he, he had that weird appearance last season. Mm hmm. And the rumor is he should appear this season. Kelly Bishop is is in. I think it's going to be wall to wall some Gilmore Girls stuff. I think that also I had heard talk of Lauren Graham being involved at some point. Now, I have no idea if she's going to make a little guest star appearance or something. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just causing trouble because I have no idea. But I'm going to throw it out there in the in the big old universe and hope maybe something is going to pop up on my screen. So do you have any predictions coming up for our next episode? We need to see Midge. At work at the Gordon Ford show. Okay. We need to see that she is probably over her head because this is (laughs) not how she works and she's never done anything like this before. Right. And we might even see Mike Carr be a hard ass because he didn't want her there in the first place. Oh, and he didn't appreciate how she got there. Right. So no matter what, at this point, he's going to be mad. I agree with that completely. What about the rest of the family? Joel will continue to swing low. I don't think he rebuilds yet. And I don't, I mean, I I need him as a character to only be a competent provider for his kids. And that is all. (laughs) Okay. You know what? I like that. And if that's how they kind of finish Joel out, he doesn't have any more plot line really except to be a good dad, like you said, or to be a good provider for his kids and stuff. I'm cool with that too. I can live with that. I think we're going to see Abe and Rose have to figure out this mystery of why their life is going so poorly at times. I think there might be some hijinks involved there. I think there will definitely be hijinks involved. Um, I also can see that we're going to have some more Moish and Shirley action because we've got this looming divorce. I've got to say... They don't want their butts to touch. Oh my God, that Paul, that is what I was going to say. I want us every episode for season five to have like a favorite line. And my favorite line from this episode was that they put up plexiglass so their butts don't touch in bed but that they can still see through in case the other one's choking so there is still some love there (laughs) i thought all of that was awesome and i feel like in this like post pandemic you know there's still plexiglass up in some places the concept of like looking through to each other to make sure you're not choking but also not touching butts feels very (laughs) pandemic times (laughs) so funny it was i was laughing a lot through these through this episode i love that because you weren't in some of them so this really brought it back right like this was familiar oh one thing i gotta tell you that i did not like and this is not anything that old asp could possibly know but (laughs) they used a laugh track for the gordon ford show that is the identical laugh track that they used on a show that we covered here on pod clubhouse called kevin can f himself and whenever they played the laugh track on that show, it was a menacing situation. It, it turned into a very bad situation. So when I heard the laugh track, my like arm hair went up. I was like, something mm. bad's going to happen. And we it was watch not a lot of sitcoms around. Here. Well, it wasn't intended for that. Here's the thing modern day sitcoms don't use that same laugh track. This is a specific laugh track. I'm telling you, I can hear. The same laughs. Well, as you you did the research with the people that made that show, right? And they confirmed that the laugh tracks that they use have been around since the dawn of television. Specifically like the 1950s, which what was so weird about that and why I was doing some research on that is because then every laugh you hear, that person's dead. Because that was like 80 years ago when they were adults laughing. So, uh, so you're like listening to dead people laughing. That freaked me out so bad. But yeah. So I don't know. That, that was one part I did not like. It's a weird detail. And if you guys watch at Kevin Can F himself, it's over on AMC. I highly recommend it. Very different, very unique story. I think you, as soon as you hear that laugh track, you're going to be like, oh, <laughs> want to run away big time. I'm very much looking forward to the rest of this season. And you guys, we will go back and finish up season four, we promise. But But for now, we're going to be all season five all the time and get all the coverage to you guys as soon as we can. This is Caroline. And this is Paul. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a five-star rating so other people can easily find the show and enjoy our theories. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening. This has been an original Pod Clubhouse production. Pod Clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration 
among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content. Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you. Pod Clubhouse.